All right, let's turn to uh, the book of Job. We've got three verses that we're going to hit on today. Chapter 19, verses 25 through 27, and those verses will be up on the screen if you care to follow along that way. So, uh, picking up in verse 25, we read, I know that my Redeemer lives, and that in the end he will stand on the earth. And after my skin has been destroyed, yet in my flesh I will see God. I myself will see him with my own eyes, I and not another. How my heart yearns within me. Now Job is a really interesting and mysterious somewhat character in the Bible. Now while many people are very familiar with Job and the trials that God allowed Satan to place into his life, not a whole lot is known about the background of Job. Scholars largely believe that he lived around the time of Abraham, and they also believe, many of them, that this was the first portion of Scripture that was written down. Now the book opens in a very familiar way. A story, again, the beginning of plot that we've probably read many times. That Joel was being, being from the land of Uz. He was a man who walked upright and feared the Lord. And he sought to avoid evil. So as you are introduced to Job at the beginning of this story, you know that he is a man who is, dis- who is committed to the Lord. Now often, if you've heard stories or, or sermons preached about Job, they've probably centered around his suffering and how he endured that suffering. And no doubt many, including myself, have found comfort and hope when we find ourselves in seasons of trials. We look at what Job had to endure, or we may say, man, if Job endured all of that, who am I to be roped in into to such concern about what I have before me? His integrity and commitment during a season of unbelievable loss is definitely one to be admired, admired and imitated by all who walk with the Lord. And so while I too have received great comfort from that portion of the, of the text, I would argue that the text that I just read this morning may be the greatest passage within the entire book. Now as we read this book, Job had many questions. A lot of them throughout, but at the end as well. And he wasn't able to answer many of those questions. He was in a season of loss and dealing with a lot of uncertainty. I can only imagine after one pillar fell, one thing fell, it's what's going to happen next. And as it keeps getting, it keeps escalating, he had to be wondering, what more must I endure? And yet in the midst of all of this pain, Job remained certain that the Lord that the Lord that he served and the relationship he had even in the midst of it. So the reason I believe this passage is so key to Job's survival during this horrific trial, his awareness of the Lord should should serve as a reminder to every believer. He always kept his eyes fixed on who God was. He knew where the source of hope and comfort was. And so ought we when we find ourselves in the midst of even our greatest trials. So as we prepare to discuss the certainties of Job's lives, I want you to consider this profound statement, which today will be our sermon in a sentence. It is this, I can live with hope and joy and without fear, because I know my Redeemer lives. Let me read that one more time. I I can live with hope and joy and without fear, because I know that my Redeemer lives. So we're going to kind of break that 
last part of that apart here a little bit. And so first, what we find in verse 25 that I read this morning was that Job knew the Redeemer. Now we haven't discussed the context of this passage, but this comes, this statement comes after a long discussion that Job has had with some buddies of his. Now they come around him supposedly to comfort him in the midst of his trial. Unfortunately, they don't provide him a whole lot of comfort. In fact, they seek to convince Job that he must have done something in his life. There must be some sin there that brought this suffering. So he just needs to dig a little bit harder or look a little bit more inside himself and figure it out. Certainly that must be the cause for the great loss that he has endured. In fact, they go even further to believe that Jesus, or that, excuse me, that God has punished Job and that Job must repent and return to God. Now, one of the beautiful things about this story is at the beginning, we get the back story. We get the inside story about what's going on here. We, it's revealed to us, the reader, that Satan goes to God and asks, in a sense, permission to attack God. Job. He'd lost his family, he lost his wealth, and then during a second attack, he loses his health. Now from our perspective, or from someone else, from his friend's perspective, it appears he's lost everything. That his life is in ruins. And I'm sure Job wondered why this all happened. A very question that I know many, if not all of you, have asked at some point in your life. Why, God, is this happening to me? Why now? No doubt he questioned the events of his life. Who wouldn't? Who wouldn't second-guess the things that they had done and wonder, maybe my friends are onto something here. Maybe I've overlooked something. There was not, or there was much, excuse me, that he did not understand or know. But he knew one thing preeminently. Job knew the Lord. He had a personal relationship with God. He walked with the Lord. He strived to honor and serve him daily. He lost so much that pertained to this physical life, but he had not lost his connection, his relationship with God. And as I studied this passage this past week, I came to a profound realization that not only did Job know the Redeemer, the Redeemer knew Job. Consider the words found in Job chapter 1, verse 8, towards the beginning of the book. Remember, Satan has come to God and he's been kind of traveling about trying to prey on the people of earth. And the Lord actually says to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? There is no one on earth like him. He is blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. Again, Job doesn't have the access we do. Job is not aware of this conversation that's going on. He had no idea what was about to hit his life. But prior to that, we do know that the Lord was mindful of Job and how he had lived. Those who are in Christ not only know the Lord, but are known by him. He's aware of our lives and he's mindful of them. I can't help but think... One of the passages in Matthew 21, which is enough whenever I come across it, it raises the hairs on my neck. And on my, you know, you know it's, it's where the Pharisees come to Jesus and they tell him about the miracles that they have performed in his name and how they've cast out demons. But Jesus replies and says, get away from me, you evildoers. I never knew you. So it isn't just to be that we know God, 
God needs to know us as well. In John chapter 10, verse 14, we know God does his part. It isn't a matter of whether he does his part. In fact, in John, in John 10, he says, I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep, and my sheep know me. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 19, we read, Nevertheless, God's solid foundation stands firm, sealed with this inscription, The Lord knows those who are his, and everyone who confesses the name of the Lord must turn away from wickedness. So we know that Job knew the Redeemer. But Job also, let's add another word, is Job also knew, as I said in my sermon in a sentence, he knew that the Redeemer lives. Now this may not have meant a whole lot to his friends, because after all, they were questioning his very integrity. Their lives had not suffered the loss that he had. They didn't know, they didn't even begin to know what dire straits he was in. But this single statement sums up the commitment and focus of Job at the moment of his life, that, G, that he knew that the Redeemer lives. He may have lost it all with no way of knowing what was going to happen. He didn't know the future, but again, he knew one thing for sure, and that was his Redeemer lived. His hope was not in some idol, something that was made by man's hand. He had a God, he worshipped a God who had power and authority. He didn't worship some monument that lacked the ability to see or hear or something with zero power. Job knew he served the living God. God. He served the eternal and omnipotent Lord. He knew that God was aware of the situation, that God was alive and well, able to meet whatever need Job faced. Life had not been kind to Job in recent days, but his misfortune did not alter the existence or power of the God he served. Hear what's going on here a minute. Let me just take a step aside from my notes here for a minute and say, we get sidetracked real quick when life goes sour or doesn't go the way we want it to. We need to, we need to have more Job in us of realizing that stuff is going to happen. I've heard it said, life has its share of damage control, sin problem as it is. It's got enough difficulties just in and of itself. We need to do our part try to not to multiply those things by the choices we make. So we know, we acknowledge, and we hear it in our prayer requests just about every Sunday here. All of the needs that are ongoing and the many that are not even stated. So many of us are dealing with things that are not easy. Now, I don't personally know, maybe someone can attest to someone, but I don't know personally anyone that's suffered the depths of what Job has suffered. But we do all face difficulty and pain. And if you don't, come talk to me, because I'd like to talk with you. So, everyone has suffered loss from time to time. It could be a result of uh, sin in our lives. It could be that we're being tested. But we're forced to deal with the uncertainty that lies ahead. Do you realize that? What's, you know, we, I have some of my, my day planned out, but those plans may or may not come to fruition. I don't, there's still, even in what I think is certainty, there's still uncertainty there. Things that could change my plans. We don't know what's going to come tomorrow. But we do know who holds the truth about what tomorrow will bring. We are not made, just like, just like Job, we are not serving an idol made of our own hands. We, too, serve the living God. G 
Jesus endured the most horrific treatment that a man could possibly face. He was falsely accused and condemned to death for crimes he had not committed. He was scourged and beaten beyond recognition by sinful men. He was crucified on a Roman cross where he bled and died. He is a Savior who can understand and relate to what we are going through. He endured that all for you and for me. He willingly died in our place to bear the sin and judgment that we each deserve. Jesus became the sin, and he tasted death so that we could escape the God's righteous judgment. Jesus laid down his life to purchase our redemption. He was buried in a borrowed tomb, and yet death could not hold him. He came forth triumphant over death, sin, and hell. And he ascended back to heaven so that we have an intercessor before God. We don't have to fight our battles. Jesus has fought them and won for us. We have the privilege to enter through the throne of grace, making our requests known to the one who conquered death and rose above. And so the next time, and maybe it's right now, when suffering and pain is a part of your existence, take a moment and rest in those words. Our Redeemer lives. He is alive and well today. And he's able to provide for every need that we face. And because he lives, those who are saved by grace have the promise of eternal life in him. And so too do we. Third, Job knew the Redeemer would come. For I know that my Redeemer lives, and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. Now we know with certainty that Job lived many, many, many years before the first advent of Christ. He lived prior to Jesus dying on the cross to atone for our sin, to rise triumphantly from the dead. But Job lived with certainty that the Lord would come and stand upon the earth. It is impossible for us to know if Job spoke of the first advent or the second coming, but his confidence in the Lord's appearing is evident in verse 25. Now some may consider Job and not see the significance in his faith that the Lord would come. But it reveals Job's perspective on his trials. Yes, his life had been difficult. Yes, he had suffered and lost much, but his hope was not confined to this life alone. He was looking ahead by faith to the time when Jesus would come in righteousness, restoring what sin had lost and bringing peace to earth. Job, Job revealed the hope and assurance that he had in his Lord. And I know I'm speaking to the choir on this, but life will have its share of hardship and pain. None of us live a life fully escaping adversity. We face our own mortality. If our hope, if your hope, if my hope rested on this life alone, we'd live a pretty miserable existence. But like Job, because we know Jesus, we can rejoice knowing that he will come again. He came the first time to sacrifice for our sins. He will come again as Lord and Judge. He was taken up in the clouds as he returned to the Father, but he left the promise to come again. The trials that we each face, no doubt, bring heartache and pain. But we have the assurance that he is coming again. 
and that he is coming for those who he has saved by grace. In John chapter 14, verses 1 through 3, and if you find yourself in a place where you are troubled by the heartache of this life, these are very comforting words. He says, do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. For my Father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you may also be where I am. So Jesus, or so Job knew the Redeemer, and he knew that the Redeemer lives, and he also knew that the Redeemer would come again. Finally, Job knew that there was life after death. He wrote in verse 26, I'm going to read this again, 26 and 27, it says, And though after my skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh shall I see God, whom I shall see for myself and my, mine eyes shall behold, and not another, though my reins be consumed within me. Although Job lived before Christ would come and conquer death, he had the hope and assurance of a life beyond the grave. He was confident that he would stand in the presence of God and that his eyes would be fixed on the one he loved and served. Job knew that his life was brief and he knew that death was certain. He knew that his body, that all of our bodies would eventually return to the dust of the earth. And yet he knew that life could be found in the Lord. He did not fear death because he knew, as we should all be comforted by, that we will enter in to the Lord's presence following our death. This is the cornerstone upon which our faith in Christ is built. Those who are born again, forgiven of their sin, reconciled to God, are promised eternal life to him. And unless he comes again, we will only experience death. And while death is a certainty in this life, it is not the end of our existence. In fact, believers pass through the gates of death immediately right in to their next life, their eternal state. Job was theologically correct in his thoughts regarding death the existence of the, etern of the eternal world. Believers, as believers, we will see God. We will stand in his presence through all eternity. And we will enjoy his presence. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1, Paul writes, For we know that if the earthly tent was, we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, <coughs> An eternal house in heaven not built by human hands. Skip forward seven verses. He says, We are confident, I say, and would prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. Go even further into first Corinthians or in back into first Corinthians chapter fifteen. He's, Paul wrote, Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all asleep, but we will be changed in a flash. In a twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality. When the perishable have been clothed with, Im with the imperishable, and the mortal with the immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up with victory, or in victory. Where, O oh death, is your victory. Where, O oh death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God. He gives us victory through Christ Jesus, our Lord. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. 
Always give yourself fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that your labor is not in vain. So we know, as I've stated multiple times, but with the story of Job, I don't think you can emphasize this enough. Job suffered so much, but most importantly, his faith was not destroyed. In the midst of this pain, he was comforted because he knew his Redeemer lived. He was confident that God would come and he would enjoy God's presence beyond death. He did not fear death because he knew he was securely in the hands of God. This statement of Job's is one of the most profound in Scripture. Can you truly say, I know my Redeemer lives? Do you know Christ as Lord and Savior? Have you responded to this gracious offer of salvation through repentance and faith? You heard me say this probably about a month or two ago. Again, if, if the answer to that question is no, today is the day of salvation. Don't wait. Don't push it off. You know, none of the kids are in here anymore, but if they're three, if they're five, if they're 12, if they're 15, if they don't have a personal relationship with Jesus... Today is the day. But if you have, we can celebrate together, rejoice that we have been saved and we can rest assured in God's grace. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the story of Job and and uh, it's, it's such a helpful story in reminding us of things that we have to endure, Lord, and maybe not to the depth of what Job experienced, but, but in reality, when we experience trials in life, they feel like what Job must have experienced. They can feel like they are the end. We can get focused on the here and the now and, and what implications whatever it is that lies before us may have, or how quickly news that we receive can, can be and feel life-altering. And it, and it can, Lord, and we, and we, and we rightfully can mourn and, and, uh, and lament over the things that we must deal with in this life, Lord. Those are godly responses, and yet one of the things we can take away from Job is a reminder that we must continue to trust in you. Lord, you are the one who created the world. You are the author of life. You are master over all. You have control over every sickness that we deal with, every trial that we are tasked with, Lord. We also know that you have promised to provide us, through you, a way through the trials of this life. Or do you ask us to trust you? A statement so simple to say and so difficult in the midst of the fires to, to hold on to, Lord. And yet, just as we have a mast and a boat hanging out in our parking lot this morning, we need that to hang on to sometimes, Lord. You are our anchor. So help us when we are feeling adrift to find that anchor through your word, through prayer, through fellowship and, uh, and uh, connection with the brothers and sisters here at First Baptist. Lord, when we see others out around us that are adrift, Lord, help us to uh, be a stabilizing force for them. Lord, help us to point them to you because we know that you are the very thing that we all need. We thank you for each person in this room and those that are here and those who cannot be with us here today for a number of reasons. Lord, be with them, heal them, uh, continue to bind them up, Lord, and, and as we go forth today, 
We are reminded that we are sent for a purpose, Lord. Not to just fill time and space, but to occupy in such a way that we are honoring you and seeking to grow the kingdom. In your name we pray. Amen. Please stand for the closing benediction and our closing song. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you in this life harmony with one another in accordance with Christ Jesus so that together with one voice we can glorify the Lord Jesus Christ and his Father, our God. Remember, church, this week and every week you are sent. Go be missionaries out in the field.